I'm going to go ahead and welcome everybody, even as people are still logging on. Um, welcome to Crises of Pandemic Proportions. Uh, my name is Brody Fisher, and I am uh, the director until the end of June of the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Chicago. And it is an enormous pleasure today um, for us to be able to welcome three uh, experts in the uh, regional politics and histories of three countries that are very close to the University of Chicago and our research interests and certainly the interests of our students and faculty. Um, and those countries being Colombia and Mexico and um, Brazil. And so I'm gonna start by just giving a brief introduction of all of our speakers. And um, then we will go on to a question and answer period where I'll give the panelists a, a prompt and they'll speak a little bit about what's going on um, both with COVID-19 and with the reaction to it uh, in, in each of the respective countries. And then we'll, we'll open up around one o'clock for everyone to be able to put in their questions in the chat box. I'm sure there will be lots of questions uh, and we're eager to, to uh, um, give a chance for everybody to get their voice heard. Um, so I'll begin by introducing Anna Arjona. Um, Anna uh, uh, received her PhD from Yale University in 2010, and she has been a fellow at Columbia and at the Kellogg Institute at Notre Dame. Uh, she was also the director of the Center of the Study of Security and Drugs at Los Andes University in Bogota, and she's also an associate researcher at that institution. Uh, her research focuses on the dynamics and legacies of organized yeah. violence, especially civil wars and organized crime. Um, she also focuses on local governance, state building, and the foundations of political order. Um, she is the author of an award-winning book, um, which received the Conflict Resolution Society Book of the Year Award in 2018. And the name of that book is uh, Rebelocracy, Social Order in the Colombian Civil War. She also co-edited Rebel Governance in Civil War by Cambridge University Press, and she's the author of many articles and chapters. So Anna, thank you so much for um, coming to us from nearby Evanston, I think that's where you are, um, and being part of this conversation. Um, our second panelist is Carlos Bra Bravo Regidor, who is a very old friend of the center, uh, was a student at Chicago, and is currently um, the director of the uh, Programa de Periodismo y Políticas Públicas of the CIDE, uh, one of the premier uh, university institutions in Mexico. And he's also a very frequent um, contributor and commentator in um, the world of pu public intellectuals, both in Mexico and in the United States. Uh, he has published, among other places, in uh, the journals Proceso, El Universal, Horizontal, Letras Libres, Vice News, Animal Politico, Newsweek in Español, The Guardian, and The New Yorker. So Carlos has a, a, a very effective voice um, thinking especially about uh, issues that entwine his deep knowledge of history with his deep knowledge of current political affairs in both Mexico and the United States. Uh, our final panelist, Ben Lessing, who is coming to us actually from Rio, not just with the background there, um, is an associate professor of political science at the University of Chicago. It's very nice to be able to say that. Congratulations. Um, and he will also uh, assume the reins as the faculty director for class beginning in 2021 after Claudia Brittenham takes over this July um, for a year. Um, Ben received his MA in economics and his PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley. And he has been a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford. Um, he also currently has um, a grant from the Carnegie Foundation um, to fund his current work on prison gangs in Rio de Janeiro and elsewhere. Um, and he, uh, in his um, research and publications, has focused mainly on issues of uh, drug gangs and drug wars and peace processes in Colombia, Mexico, and especially Brazil. His first book, Making Peace and Drug Wars, Crackdowns and Cartels in Latin America, um, was published in 2017 and was an outstanding academic title in choice in 2018. And he's currently working on a second project called Criminal Leviathans, How Gangs Govern, Organize Crime, and Challenge the State from Behind Bars. Um, so as you see, we have a real range of expertise and engagement with um, issues that run much deeper than the current crisis, and we can't wait to hear everybody um, give their contributions. 
So I'd like to start um, by just asking each of the panelists, beginning with Anna and then continuing to Carlos and to Ben, um, what is the situation with COVID-19 in uh, Colombia and in Mexico and in Brazil? And um, how would you briefly sort of summarize what the relevant issues are, or what the dimensions of the crisis are, and what you would like people to be aware of? Thank you very much for the invitation, Brody. Uh, well, Colombia, in comparative perspective, especially we think of Mexico and Brazil, actually reacted quite early uh, to the virus. Especially, I think the leadership of, of the mayor of Bogota, Claudia Lopez, was very important, and it, she proposed this, um, um, like, practice a stay home situation that actually got extended and that is still in place. It started on, on March 24th, uh, I think. And the president issued a stay home order right after for the entire country. So in general, I think the national government and the regional and local governments have really been trying to take many measures. Uh, again, it was very early. So Colombia has right now around 25,000 cases and about 800 deaths, which is lower to many other countries, although given the capacities of the, of the public health system, um, this is a lot, right? And, and if it is not controlled, the country would be in a very big crisis because it cannot really treat so many people at the same time. So um, taken together, these different levels of governments, there have been many measures put in place. Some of them are designed to try to control the spread of the virus. So as I said, the stay home order is actually a very strict stay home order. Um, in the United States, um, in most places, we can go outside, we can take a walk, you can walk with more members of your family. Uh, there are no strict guidelines on how many times you can go to buy groceries. In Colombia, there are very, very strict guidelines. People are being sanctioned if they are outside when they are not supposed to. Um, and so it's been a, a very real, real, uh, like, stalemate of the economy and of society. Um, the international airport was closed. Um, that was actually a source of tension between the national government and the mayor of Bogota because the mayor wanted it to be closed sooner. Uh, so the country has really been in a lockdown. Many people who are from Colombia were unable to go back to the country when the airport was closed. So I think all of this has actually really helped in decreasing the speed of the spread of the virus. Um, oh, and I wanted to add that a third of all the cases are in Bogota, right? So Bogota is really the epicenter of the, of the epidemic in, in the country. So in addition to these measures to try to decrease the, or, or to slow down the spread of the virus, the country has implemented many measures to try to help those in need and especially the poor well, companies but also the poor and most vulnerable people and of course this has not been sufficient right i mean there are many decrees that the government has has issued in order to provide loans to uh, businesses um, forbidding evictions of, of tenants uh, until july if they cannot pay allowing local governments to pay for public utilities and for the basic services for the most vulnerable in their communities. Uh, so they, they have been really trying to do a lot. A lot of local governments have tried to deliver groceries to the most vulnerable and the poorest, uh, but nothing is enough, right? Uh, and, and I can talk about this later, but Colombia is a country where the informal sector is really, really big. A lot of households depend on day-to-day -day activities in the informal sector. If you are required to stay at home, there is no way to bring bread to the table. There is no way you can pay the utilities, the bills. So we have a, a real crisis of, of lack of income, right? Um, and I don't know, you have probably seen some news. This has been in the New York Times, in El País, in Spain, in, in a lot of the major newspapers. There is um, a symbol now that homes, that families use when they are in, a, in an extreme situation of not being able to eat. And it's that they hang like a red rack uh, in front of, of, of their homes. And you see these images of, of neighborhoods and communities where there is a red rag almost everywhere. And this means people are not eating. So it's, even though there have been many measures to try to, to address the economic effects of the crisis, it's not enough. And many, many people are, are just really falling into poverty. Um, and then finally, there are measures to try to improve the quality and the capacity of the public health system. So there are all kinds of, of new um, measures for the central government to pay for some of the 
builds of hospitals to transfer money directly to hospitals. There have been parts of the budget and, and different things that have been done to move resources to the public uh, health system. And again, this is not enough. The, the, even though the capacity has improved, it's not where it has to be to be able to deal with the number of cases that, that the country can deal with. So again, I think in comparison, the country is doing much better than many other countries, but still the situation is, is really bad and the economic crisis can have horrible consequences. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later on. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's terrific to begin this webinar by really focusing in on the very different meaning that shutting down the economy has in economies that have a big informal sector. And I'm sure we'll get back to that in our discussion with the other um, countries. Um, Carlos, tell us about the, the situation in Mexico. Well, uh, the situation in Mexico is very different from uh, the Colombian case we just heard. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically on two, on two aspects, of course, the health, uh, the health emergency and the economic emergency. Uh, uh, just to give you a quick sense, uh, as of yesterday, there were a bit more than 80,000 uh, positive cases of COVID-19 registered throughout the whole pandemic. And we just passed the threshold of 9,000 deaths. Of course, you, mean, you, you know the numbers need to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, particularly the positive cases, because it, they are a function of the number of tests being carried out. And well, this, this might be the first thing I, I, I need to say. Uh, Mexico has been one of the countries that has conducted the least number of tests, uh, not only in Latin America, but uh, worldwide. And this was a deliberate decision made from the very beginning. Uh, health authorities are were relying uh, you know, for a very long period of time on, a, on an alternative model called the Sentinel model, which was put in place in 2008, 2009, when there was the, the you know, the so-called Mexican flu crisis uh, back then, which was controlled very successfully. And as a result of that, this alternative system of tracking uh, viruses and potential epidemics was put in place. Uh, but, you know, to, to be honest, the, the institutional capacities of the health system in Mexico have been put to the test. And in, in certain aspects, they have been successful in terms, for instance, of the saturation of uh, hospital services, of, you know, general beds and particular intensive care or ventilator beds. Uh, we have not reached a breaking point yet, at least. Uh, the numbers are between 60% and 70% uh, at the national level. Uh, in some cases, like Mexico City, for instance, or the state of Mexico, uh, occupation has been a bit higher, but we haven't reached 100% or you know, above that. At the, at the very same time, you know, that being uh, you know, good news, the bad news is you know, the quality of the information we're getting. Uh, every day we get updates, and one of the things that are, is more disquieting is the fact that, you know, when we get information for a day, you know, you can say, well, this day we had, I don't know, 20 deaths. But the next day they will say, oh, remember that day we reported 20 deaths? No, there were no 20, there were 30. And then at the next day, no, it was 60. So the number of, the, the graphs of, of, the, of the number of deaths are moving in such a way which reveal pretty evidently like the weakness of the institutional capacities of the Mexican state to produce opportune and reliable information. Uh, of course, this has lent itself to a lot of speculation, to a lot, of course, of conspiracy theories that the government is hiding the numbers. Uh, in the case of Mexico City, this is interesting, this was in the New York Times not that long ago, uh, it was discovered that Mexico City had like an alternative account which was very different from the federal account of the death, uh, and that it, it reported uh, about three times more deaths than the official account, uh, and that was never made public. It hasn't be made, been made public yet, but uh, I mean, th this is one of the, I would say, one of the key uh, elements of the Mexican response, the credibility of the numbers and all the, the you know, the politing this has given rise to. In general terms, uh, as I was saying, you know, when Mexico hit the 20-day threshold or the 40-day threshold, you know, the situation didn't look as dire as in other cities, as in Madrid or as in, um, 
uh, New York or certain places in Italy. But the thing is, we were supposed to hit the peak of the pandemic, you know, in the first 10 days of May. And that date has been pushed forward for the rest of the month and it has been pushed to June. Uh, so every day we have this, uh, the, the Deputy Secretary of Health telling us, next week we will reach the peak. And next week we will reach the peak. And, and this of course, well damages the credibility of the numbers and of the very authorities. Uh, I mean, we all know that all across the, the globe, this is a problem, the accuracy of the numbers. We know very little about this disease and we still know very little of how to track it properly. So that is not uh, a problem itself of you know, Mexican specificity, but a problem worldwide. Having said that, the, you know, the scope, the size of the problem is very different from country to country. And in the case of Mexico, it seems to be uh, very big. Uh, now, moving on to the economic aspects of the crisis. Uh, yeah, and in this, Mexico has been very heterodox, so to speak. Uh, the size of the stimulus package that Mexico has put together is less than 1% of its gross domestic product. It's one of the smallest, not only you know, compared to, to G20 economies, but also uh, you know, compared to the region in Latin America. And this is also the product of a deliberate decision of President Lopez Obrador, who, uh, you know, who's supposed to be a man of the left, but who turned out to be very conservative fiscally and very prone to austerity policies, uh, regardless of the fact that you know, he has made a career, a political, a very successful political career out of criticizing neoliberal austerity measures. Uh, so, and well, so the reasoning goes that you know, incurring in debt has, you know, has provoked Mexico many problems in the past, it has lent itself to corruption and you know, to, the, to the very well-known argument of socializing the losses and privatizing the gains. So Lopez Obrador has, instead of you know, asking credit, and it's, it, for Mexico, even at this point, it's not that hard to, you know, to access money markets uh, globally. Actually, Mexico has an open line of credit with the uh, um, International Monetary Fund of $60 billion on the ready, uh, and, but Mexico has decided not to use those resources and instead, you know, uh, deepen the austerity and the cuts program that President Lopez Obrador put in place since he came to government. Uh, this of course has bewildered uh, not only progressives in Mexico or people who were uh, on the side of Lopez Obrador, but even, you know, people in the right or former, you know, neoliberal, so to speak, because there is a wide consensus across the political spectrum that the way to go right now is to, you know, borrow, borrow money and, uh, you know, inject it into the economy. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious at this point, everybody's doing it, but Mexico is taking an alternative route. It has been calculated that the crisis will cost just, you know, by the end of this year, at least 1 million jobs that will be lost. And, you know, uh, a very recent calculus of a, of, of a public entity called Coneval, which is the entity in charge of measuring the results of social policy. Coneval has said that Mexico might be, might be having about 10 million people falling, additional to, to the ones we have, uh, 10 million people falling below poverty line because of the impact of the crisis. Uh, a point I want to, to pick up from what, Bro, from what Brodin said is you know, that more than 50% of the Mexican economy is in the informal sector. And this has proved quite a conundrum because on, on the one hand, it's, it's known that the, the people in the informal sector and in the urban centers are gonna be hit the hardest because of the measures to, to, to close down the country. And in contrast with the Colombian case, in Mexico, the stay home uh, program has been voluntary. There's no official enforcement, it's non-mandatory, it hasn't been that strict. Uh, the government has sold this as a, you know, as a testament of its voluntary, of its uh, democratic, uh, you know, compromise as to not force citizens in, into their homes. But of course, I mean, it's clear that 
uh, people are still going out, and particularly people you know, in the informal sector who really need to come out and earn a living on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and the thing is, you know, there is actually not a good program in place to help those people stay uh, at home. So they, they are still coming out. They're still taking a hit and they're falling. If, if you look at a map, for instance, of Mexico City, it is clear that the zones where, you know, that are more marginalized or more poor are, are, are being hit the hardest. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm sure we will come back to those details later uh, with follow-up questions. But uh, so in general, Mex the Mexican economy, the prospects for the Mexican economy look really bad. Uh, most of the, um, you know, forecasting about how the economy is going to perform are, you know, estimating a hit between five and 10 percent of contraction, which is one of one of the largest hits also in G20 countries in Latin America all across the globe. And um, as I said, I mean, th th there were some, there, there have been good decisions. For instance, Mexico closed schools very early on, uh, on March 20. And, and I think that was a measure that ha helped slow the spread of the disease. So what we're seeing here in Mexico is, you know, a case in which the disease is, is spreading slower, but the growth is steady. So the, the sensation is that the worst is yet to come both in health and in economic terms. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, sadly, that seems to be the way that so many of us are thinking about it with the uncertainty of the next few months. Um, everyone here will notice that in some ways we're, we're going in um, at least ascending order of the gravity of deaths and cases. And Ben Lessing, uh, who comes to us from Rio, is now going to give us a little bit of a picture of what's going on in Brazil as it uh, takes over the headlines as the, the new um, most intense case of the spread and the chaos that comes from this disease. You are muted, Ben. <laughs> thanks for that introduction, Brody. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming today. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be able to uh, share some of this with you and to learn about the, uh, these, these details about the cases of Mexico and Colombia. Um, so I think as all of you, you know, who've been even just reading, you, know, you don't have to read Brazilian newspapers to know that Brazil has sort of burst onto the world stage now as a, as a leader uh, in the COVID-19 crisis in the worst possible way, or really the worst possible ways, uh, because Brazil right now is suffering from, you know, a, a, at least a triple crisis, a health crisis, an economic crisis, and a really severe political crisis. It's hard, I think, to overstate, especially um, you know, to sort of people not here in Brazil, just how severe the political crisis is. It's, it's something like what was going on in the U.S. during the impeachment of Donald Trump. So that every day there are, uh, you know, some major tensions between the Supreme Court and the, uh, and the executive branch, as well as Congress over sort of, and, and, and we're you know, really in the midst of a constitutional crisis as all these other crises are unfolding. But let me start with the health crisis or really speak mostly about the health crisis. Um, Brazil went into this, uh, you know, looking sort of strong. Uh, I, I remember very clearly the second week of March before there had been a single death reported in Brazil, uh, the, uh, the, ver the early uh, moves by the health ministry and also the education sectors to close schools, uh, to put in place sort of early lockdown measures. So really even as Chicago, for example, was locking down, Brazil was already locking down. So it seemed to be ahead of the game. Um, and things seemed like, and, and, and there's, a, there's a strong, you know, a relatively strong public health system in Brazil. Uh, the, 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 the SUS, the Sistema Único de Saúde, and the, and the Ministry of, of Health at the federal level are full, stock full of, of very serious professionals. The, 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 the basic research system in Brazil is strong. So it seemed, and it had a lot of experience dealing with infectious diseases, including Zika and dengue outbreaks in previous years. So it seemed like there was some level of expertise and that people were taking things seriously. And the, the, the initial lockdown in March, at least from my perspective, uh, was relatively well implemented. So businesses and bars and restaurants were shut down. Uh, there was a lot of buy-in from both the local health ministry at the municipal level, uh, local police, firefighters, lifeguards, all working together to make sure that things like the beaches were closed, restaurants and bars were closed, 
um, there was a great deal of concern about how this would play out in the favelas and there was both community activism and NGOs sh uh, shifting into gear to help uh, make sure people were getting enough to eat at the same time helping uh, even you know in some cases criminal organizations helping to make sure that uh, people understood the stakes and would stay inside and deliver things like um, uh, masks and and alcohol gel and whatnot working again uh, worked fighting price gouging by local stores so there was a strong feeling of uh, solidarity solidarity in trying to uh, put in place preventive measures but at the very top uh, as you probably know uh, the bolsonaro government uh, is became sort of very quickly became the undisputed world leader in denialism denying uh, the the importance of the of the covid uh, pandemic denying that it was a serious disease uh, sort of uh, dismissing the idea that uh, that this was going to affect brazil and in particular dismissing the need for major lockdown activities that would hurt the economy um, and uh, there was a very early move, we now know, a very early move to sideline the Ministry of Health uh, and instead bring in um, part, a lot of Bolsonaro's ministries are, uh, are headed by uh, military figures, by generals, either active duty generals or uh, reserve, uh, generals in the reserve. Um, and so they, uh, the, the Casa Civil, which is part of the government, was kind of brought in to, 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 to in some ways get between the Ministry of Health and the final decisions. And so that led to a, a real walking back of a lot of the federal Ministry of Health uh, 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 dictates about how to impose the lockdown. It led to a kind of public stance on the part of the uh, Bolsonaro government that this wasn't a big deal. He would pose in public, he'd go and meet his supporters, hold babies, not wear a mask, uh, you know, engage in this kind of risky behavior and really dismiss anybody who, 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 who said that the disease was potentially dangerous. Um, and it, it, it kind of behind the scenes, this also prevented the Ministry of, of Public Health, uh, the, sorry, the Ministry of Health from uh, uh, obtaining a sort of adequate testing infrastructure. So Brazil uh, uh, was also, you know, very, very lax in terms of testing and, and remained lax all through March and April, not able to obtain the, uh, the equipment it needed to do testing. So what's that, the end result of this has been that Brazil is now number two in the world. It's been a very slow rise, but now, but a steady rise. And so now the daily death rate in Brazil regularly tops that of the United States. Uh, at the most recent count, we are at 438,000 cases of COVID with 27,000 deaths. The death rate is regularly over 1,000 per day. And uh, projections have, uh, some projections now have Brazil at 125,000 deaths by August, which could conceivably top the total death toll in the US. Testing is very low. So those are, the, those are often uh, stark underestimates. To give you an idea, in Italy, uh, there, are, there are about 57,000 tests per million people in the population. In the US, there are about 45,000 tests per million people. And in Brazil, there's about 3,000 tests per million people. So an order of magnitude less testing than is happening in the US. Um, and the Ministry of Health is now leaderless. So, the, so Bolsonaro fired his Minister of Health, uh, who, who was becoming very popular at Bolsonaro's expense in April. He was uh, publicly disagreeing with Bolsonaro and, so, uh, and had about 76% approval rating compared to Bolsonaro's at the time, 40, 45%. So Bolsonaro fired him in April and replaced him. Uh, and his replacement quit after only 10 days because Bolsonaro under, publicly undercut him uh, by announcing that he was gonna reopen bars and, uh, and gyms, academias. And so now in the wake of that second uh, uh, loss of a minister, there's been no replacement. And, the current, and currently the Ministry of Health is being led by an interim uh, minister who is also a, a, a general in the army and is not really a, a qualified public health specialist. Uh, and that general, uh, Eduardo Pazuelo, has done Bolsonaro's bidding uh, on the front, on the COVID front, by, for example, approving the use of hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine uh, for anyone with any symptoms of COVID, despite you know going against World Health Organization uh, recommendations and by uh, taking off of the Ministry of Health's website information on the number of deaths. So now the Ministry of Health does not report the number of deaths at the national level, 
it reports what Bolsonaro calls a placar da vida, which is like a, a health, a life scorecard, which is just the number of people who have recovered. So from the Ministry of Health, you can find out how many people have recovered, but you can't find out how many people have died. Uh, and I'll just briefly say on the economic front, things aren't great either. Uh, uh, the good news is that Brazil very quickly passed a, a kind of a, a, a auxilio. So anybody who is, uh, you know, 600 reais, basically for anybody, uh, you know, sort of poor enough to deserve it, 43% uh, of all Brazilians applied for it. Uh, however, only 60% have been able to receive anything so far. There have been a lot of issue, bureaucratic issues with getting it paid out. Uh, the Bolsa Familia structure works well, so those people involved in Bolsa Familia are able to receive it pretty quickly, but of course, not everybody was signed up for that. So there's a lot of interesting issues there for people interested in eventually moving towards a basic, a guaranteed basic income. Uh, Brazil is moving into a major recession. Data is just out today showing a 1.5% uh, decrease in the GDP, so we're in recession territory. If that continues for another quarter, we'll be, it'll be a full-blown recession. Uh, although agronegocios is doing okay, interestingly. And uh, that minister of the economy, Paulo Guedes, who is this kind of major privatization figure, he was really key in Bolsonaro even winning the election in the first place, who was kind of pushing for a, a kind of Washington consensus style privatization policies. Uh, you know, his project is totally stymied because Brazil's moving in towards a kind of a Keynesian, you know, uh, uh, pub, uh, basic income, you know, sending out, mailing out checks, helicopter drop kind of a policy. But nonetheless, he's, he seemed very sort of this, uh, uh, he seemed a bit out of touch. So since the beginning of this crisis, he's had to, he's continually underestimated what the economic in impact of the crisis is gonna be. And, uh, you know, even just recently sort of saying, yeah, you know, um, we may have to adjust downward some of our projections. So he's been a little bit behind the curve in terms of anticipating just how severe uh, the economic side of this COVID crisis will be. So I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to the remaining questions. Well, that gives us, I think, a really um, deep and rich sense of, in, in a very brief time, of what is going on in each of these countries. And I'd like to invite everybody who is listening to this to put your questions in the chat box. And at one o'clock, we'll, around one o'clock, we will move on to, to have some time to, to respond to people's questions. So I already see one there um, from our friend Steve Server. And if anyone else wants to begin to put questions in, um, please do so. But I'd like to shift the focus of our discussion a little bit away from the immediate dimensions of the health and economic crisis and ask our panelists to think a little bit about um, this sort of horrific metaphor that's been floating around about COVID. That is the notion, notion that we can think of COVID-19 as a tide that kind of goes out and shows who's wearing no clothes, right? That all of a sudden, you know, in this crisis, what you see is um, the reality of what was there before as much as you see the new of new economic and health effects of the crisis itself. And so I'm wondering if our panelists have anything um, that they would like to share with us about what it is that this crisis is revealing, um, both in the negative sense and perhaps in some cases in the positive sense, about the pre-existing um, array of forces within governments, about the capacities of governments, about the capacity of civil, civil society. What are we learning about um, the, the structure of governor, governance and the effectiveness of governance um, in uh, Colombia, Mexico, and Brazil? So let's go back to Ana to begin. Ana, you're muted, I think. <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, I think there are a few structural conditions of the country that um, are essential to understand how the crisis is unfolding, right? So I mentioned before in, um, inequality and informality, and I think both are really crucial. You can't understand what is happening and you can't think of the long-term effects without considering the history of inequality and informality in Colombia. Um, one of the main concerns that people have right now, it's, it's again with the most vulnerable, um, different studies that are already trying to estimate the effects of the crisis suggest that we will go back one or two decades. Um, Colombia had about uh, 20, sorry, 49 percent of the population was under economic, uh, the, sorry, the monetary poverty line in the, the beginning of the century, in 2000, and by 2018 uh, the country was around 27 percent. 
economists are estimating that we will go back to something similar to what we have in the early 2000s. Um, inequality had decreased a little bit. Colombia is a very unequal country. Uh, I think uh, the last data shows the country just uh, below Brazil. Uh, and there were a few gains in the last uh, few years and in the last decades. And economists are already estimated that we will go back uh, to more inequality. So I think these two really structural, traditional problems of the country are going to, to really condition the effects of the crisis. Um, another critical component is the weak capacity of the state and the poor presence of the state in many different territories in the country. And this, of course, undermines any implementation of any measures everywhere, but again, puts the most vulnerable communities at a disadvantage and in that way deepens inequality in additional ways, right? So for example, if we look at the situation of many ethnic minorities in the country, especially indigenous communities, there is a really horrible, horrible risk to these communities. They are um, not receiving the attention that they need. Some of them have been really exposed, especially in the border with Brazil, to, to the virus. And there is just no state in a lot of these territories to help them. There is no way to, to have a, a, a rapid response, right? So we see the the weakness in the presence, in the capacity of the states to be present in the hinterland of the country and the channels that the state has to really reach citizens to deliver all the, the help, the aid and, and the health services that, that people need. Um, I would add that an additional component in Colombia is of course the, the historic current conflict and all the different ways in which the country is dealing with that right now. So. Um, we see armed actors taking on different roles as the crisis unfolds. In some places, the groups have actually enforced the curfews even more. They have really followed sort of the, the rules of the government and have to really, really try to enforce the rules. But the groups have also, and, and have even provided some groceries and some help, but the groups have also taken advantage of the situation to expand their territorial control, especially in some areas of the country. The, most, the ones that have been uh, enduring more violence in the last few years after the signing of the peace agreement. So we also see that side of the country, the conflict, the implementation of, of the peace agreement. All of these are, again, conditions that structure how different communities are going to be implemented, are going to be affected by the crisis and the abilities of the state to, to implement these measures. So I think if I had to, to summarize, like the main sort of historical attribute of the country that is conditioning the unfolding of the crisis and the effects, I would say it's inequality. There is no way to compare and to assess the effects for the most privileged and for the capital uh, cities in the regions with what people are enduring in the most violent, the most abandoned areas of the country. And of course, I'm sure that's what we're gonna hear in the cases of everywhere, including our own country as well. So um, yeah, it's sobering. Um, Carlos, uh, what would you like to add to that? Well, um, one of the interesting things of, uh, well, of, of many countries in Latin America is how the federal system has impacted you know, the quality and the promptness of the response. Uh, in Mexico, uh, you know, governors were a key opposition figure. Since Mexico became a democracy, you know, the democratization process ran parallel to a process of empowerment of state authorities, both in terms of their budgets, which grew significantly, and also in terms of their political influence. And yet, when Lopez Obrador won in 2018, that, uh, you know, very central opposition figure or counterweight figures that governors had become pretty much disappeared. And, uh, you know, governors became very weak because their finances were very weak, because you know, a lot of governors, you know, uh, you know, were potentially, you know, uh, potentially signals for corruption because they lost control of their local congresses or because, you know, the representatives to the federal congress from those states were mostly from the party's president. So really the, the, the weakness of the governors is one, was one of the key features uh, you know, of the number of changes that the victory of Lo Lopez Obrador meant 
but the COVID crisis has you know, provided an opportunity for governors to come to the fore again, particularly the governor of Jalisco, who belongs to a party called Movimiento Ciudadano, also the governor of Nuevo León, who is an independent governor, he has no party affiliation, and the governors of the PAN, the, the center-right party, have you know, taken advantage of the opportunity, of course, you know, to join forces and, and actually you know, represent a certain sense of grievance uh, you know, regarding the federal government response, have taken unilateral measures by their own, some of them of questionable legal foundations, but clearly politically motivated and in the good and in the bad sense, you know, responding to a local grassroots demand, but also trying to create a certain contrast with, uh, with the president. So that, that has been interesting. You know, numbers vary very significantly from state to state. And uh, this, ha this even reached the point where a couple of governors that belonged to the president's coalition, the governor of Baja California, Bonilla, and the governor of Puebla, uh, Barbosa, were openly voicing uh, grievances regarding you know, the lack of uh, equipments, of medical equipments that the government was providing to them, the lack of budgetary relief. Uh, so this really shook uh, what had been a certain inertia for the first year and a half of the Lopez Obrador government, where really there were no, no alternative or no counterweight, no, no checking voices to the voice of the president and the federal administration. Uh, another thing that has happened that, that's been on the news, and I think it's very telling of what you were saying, Brody, regarding you know, long-term patterns or developments that the emergency has made more salient or more visible, more explicit, has to do with crime and insecurity. Uh, drug trafficking organizations in certain zones of, zones of the country have actually imposed uh, toques de queda or uh, you know, stay at home policies with much more force than the actual you know, federal, state or the, or the, or the local authorities. Uh, they have also started you know, giving away uh, provisions, dispensas, as we call them here, food to people with, with the logos of the organization. There seems to be, you know, an opening there for them to gain some social legitimacy and support. And they are actually, in many ways, you know, getting ahead of the government in terms of supporting those in need. Of course, the government, Lopez Obrador has been, you know, openly against it, but, you know, his capacity to actually move from condemning it to actually doing something to stop it is very limited and besides it would be counterproductive so uh you know criminal organizations drug trafficking organizations have taken advantage of that opening in in, in that regard and also you know at the beginning of the crisis it was you know forecasted that maybe violence was going to be reduced uh because of the stay home policies and you know uh people who commit crimes also don't want to get, uh, to get the virus, but that was not the case. Mexico is seeing, you know, a, a consistent rise in terms, for instance, of homicides or of social conflictivity more generally, in spite of the fact uh, that we are under a health, a health emergency. Um, there have been images, not, not only of, uh, you know, conflicts, you know, killings, between different organizations, but particularly of criminal organizations giving away, you know, to, to, to population in marginalized or very poor zones, uh, you know, food or clothes, or, you know, just providing some sort of support. Uh, and this, of course, you know, is a testament to the very uneven presence of the Mexican state across the territory. This is something that clearly didn't, ha didn't start with the new government. This is, you know, a historical legacy that has been, you know, in a way put to a, to a new stress by this situation. Uh, also, I think an, another, uh, another instance of this sort of a historical weakness that has been, you know, shown in its full capacity, in its full, you know, uh, splendor, so to, speak, so to speak, is the fiscal weakness of the Mexican state. Uh, you know, the progressives have been pushing for many, many years towards, you know, an ambitious fiscal reform that would give some fiscal space to the Mexican state, you know, in terms of, you know, investing uh, 
in infrastructure, in health, in education, or also even in police forces, you know, because of the violence crisis. You know, in a way, the COVID crisis could have provided a great argument, you know, for a fiscal, for a fisc for this fiscal reform. Uh, Santiago Levy, who's one of the, you know, of the leaders in terms of, of progressive economic thinking, has said, you know, if Mexico incurred in credit right now, if it borrowed money, that would provide the Mexican government with a very legitimate and powerful reason to say, okay, we're borrowing now, but then we're going to have to make a fiscal, fiscal reform in order to pay for these loans. Um, but well, as I said at the beginning, that, that hasn't happened. Uh, in terms of the health sector, the health sector has also been hit very hard. About uh, between 10 and 15% of the people who ha have you know, given positive results to COVID work one way or another in the public sector. There have been protests from day one from uh, doctors, nurses, people who worked you know, in administrative capacities managerial capacity that hospitals protests that they were not given you know proper instructions proper proper materials proper reconditioning of the hospitals and the procedures to move around you know the sick or the bodies um, so the health system has been hit very hard of course mexico is one of the countries of g20 economies or oecd countries that invests the least in terms of its gdp in health but also, you know, the new government also made significant cuts to the budget of the, of the health sector and actually changed one of the key policies put in place, uh, you know, throughout the, the young history of Mexican democracy, which was called the Seguro Popular, which was an attempt to really, you know, amplify the coverage of health services, particularly for people in the informal sector. Uh, up until then, you know, health services were tied to people having a formal job, to having social security, and that left out a very significant portion of the population. So the Seguro Popular was created in order to provide that public service you know, to people who were not in the formal sector. And, and that program was terminated by the Lopez Obrador administration. And a new program was just being launched, was just being put in place when the pandemic hit. So it was kind of the worst possible situation where the old program which had some problems in terms of coverage and in terms of corruption, but which have been, you know, very, you know, evaluated from all across the board and had positive results was being dismantled and nothing was being, you know, put in its place. So the health system has also shown, you know, its limits and its weaknesses. And uh, I would finally, you know, just, just to, to, to finish, uh, I would say that in general, another thing that has you know, become more salient with this crisis is uh, the democratic deterioration or deconsolidation of the Mexican political system in terms of there not being really a strong and, and you know, uh, intelligent opposition and checks, the checks and balances system you know, being bit by bit dismantled or weakened. You know, Given the scope of the, of the mistakes that the Mexican government has made, particularly, I would say, regarding the economic response, the pushback from the opposition, from civil society, has been very weak and ineffective. Thank you so much. That, that adds so many dimensions to, that are relevant, I think, also in Colombia and Brazil. Um, we're going to get toward the end of our time, so I'm going to invite um, Ben to, to jump in and both respond to the question about what happens when the tide goes out and you see what's below the, the waves. Um, but Ben, if you would also like to add anything that you have to say about what you see as the long-term impact of this crisis on Brazilian politics, on the structure of power, and Anna will in the end come back to you with that question for the last word. Um, so Ben, please. Great. Um, well, I think, you know, like Mexico and Colombia and probably a lot of Latin America, there are these basic pre-existing conditions, you know, economies that are, don't have a lot of fiscal space to borrow or are already in debt, that was certainly true in Brazil, inequality, poverty, and informal, uh, informal urbanity, right, is a big issue in Brazil, but also throughout the region. So these are places where, unfortunately, the disease is particularly likely to spread. There aren't, you know, often lack, um, uh, lack both state presence, uh, public health is weak in those areas. So those are, you know, that's very important. 
uh, pre-existing condition. The indigenous issue that Anna mentioned is obviously very strong in Brazil as well and has been you know, sort of tragic you have, uh, for, for a host of reasons, already in a weakened position with Bolsonaro's government and now facing a pandemic. There's also a global pre-existing condition, I think. Uh, you know, Latin America is on the global periphery. And so it's not surprising that countries, at least Brazil, has had a hard time getting uh, ventilators and testing equipment and so on and so forth. It's also somehow not surprising that it's sort of taken extra months for the disease to really catch here because a lot of the early transmitters were coming, you know, were elites coming back from Europe or coming back from the US. And now it's beginning to spread and, uh, and, and you know, voraciously among uh, the low income population often in, uh, uh, so, so those are I think basic, you know, true of all places. But I think what's really particular to Brazil and what I wanted to comment on today is what I see as the most important pre-existing condition, which is political. Uh, which is, you know, a lot of before before coronavirus was a thing, people were talking in Brazil about the Bolsonaro virus, that there was this sort of political phenomenon that was uh, in some, you know, in, in, in a kind of a disease. So I will just call it the Bolso 18 uh, virus. And I would like to think about the comorbidities between Bolso 18 and COVID-19, because the two diseases, if you will, are, uh, are reinforcing one another in, in very uh, in negative and, and troubling ways. I'll just say a few, but I think you could probably draw an even longer list. One is simply that a large, you know, Bolsonaro's base, which is about 30% of the population, has proven itself willing to consistently generate and live within an alternative reality that isn't really based on fact. Now, that was one thing back in November of last year when they were, you know, making up their own reality with regards to Supreme Court investigations or Bolsonaro's involvement with Milicia, sort of inside politics, inside baseball. But now these are alternative facts with regard to hydroxychloroquine and how many people have actually died, right? This is, the stakes have gone up enormously. Uh, another realm is the kind of politics that Bolsonaro practices, which I think if you aren't familiar with Bolsonaro, just think about the kind of politics that Trump practices. This is kind of like politics as pro wrestling, where every day is a kind of a confrontation with some enemy. Uh, and you know, you sort of play the cad and be the jerk and you make crass comments, homophobic or racist comments when you need to distract the press from some latest bad news. Both Trump and Bolsonaro are experts at this. You also fritar your own ministers, right? You burn out your own staff. You put, you, you, you countermand people in public. All of that stuff was part of the way these guys govern, but now that's taken on enormously higher stakes. Now you've got the, the ministry of, you know, you're fritando the minister of health. And so your ministers, you know, you burn through two ministers of health in the middle of the worst health crisis in a century. Uh, or you've got governors, you know, you pit governors against mayors and, and, and against the federal government in a way that has enormous stakes or in the thousands and thousands of deaths as a result. Mobilization is another, uh, is another part of the Bolso 18 virus. Bolsonaro is able to get people out on the streets almost at a whim. Right? He's able to convoke uh, street protests. And that was very important to his rise to power, has been important over the last two years, but it's taken on even more importance because no one else goes out. So now when you see street protests, it's Bolsonaro supporters. They're the ones willing to gather in conglomerations, and they've also become more violent. They've uh, harassed the press to the point where the press no longer covers the Palacio de Planalto, the White House, uh, and they've all harassed other protesters. So when the nurses' union was protesting bad conditions, Bolsonaro supporters went and harassed them and shut that protest down. So in many ways, Bolsonaro's street presence has gotten stronger as a result of the pandemic. And that's very key to his power. And finally, I would say there's a kind of uh, part of the Bolso 18 virus is the devil's bargain between the economic elites and Bolsonaro, right? So the economic elites, they're not really Bolsonaristas, but they were on board with him. They didn't want the PT to win. They made this devil's bargain with this sort of right-wing populist guy so that they could you know, get into power and put into, uh, put into motion a, a liberalization package. And I think that was, you know, maybe bad enough on its own terms, but now in the context of COVID, it's really feeding into this, you know, we can save lives or we can save the economy kind of false choice. 
Um, and so all of the discussion around opening, reopening, how early, what should be open first is all framed as, look, you know, people need to eat and we need to save the economy and okay, a few old people die. And it's that, that same kind of devil's bargain logic now uh, mixing together with the COVID, with the realities of COVID-19 in a way that many ec economists actually think is a false choice, right? That opening up the economy too quickly isn't going to save the economy either, as uh, it would simply cause a, a, an upswell in death. So I'll leave it at that. With regard to your last question about the future, I just will briefly say, uh, I don't, I think it can go in a lot of directions, much as it can in the US. Uh, this could, you know, there, this could bring the end of bolsonarismo. It could put a nail in the coffin, or it could cement it in different ways. It could lead to a militarized. The government is already full and more increasingly full of military figures. This, if Bolsonaro were to fall for whatever reason, the vice president is a general, so we could see a military government in Brazil in a number of different ways. Um, it, uh, Bolsonaro's own son, Eduardo, has said that there's going to be a democratic rupture. It's not a question of if; it's a question of when. Um, so that's, you know, bodes very darkly. On the other hand, uh, I think in the long term, you know, the investment in public health, pe people are very, uh, the, 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 the public is very much on the side of public health in Brazil. And so I think in the long run, there's been a, 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 a conscientization. People are becoming more conscientious about the role of, of professionalized public health. And Bolsonaro's support is, has gone down. His hardcore support is strong, but the rest of the population has turned against him. So. I think which direction this goes, it's very hard to say. Thank you. And Anna, I don't know if you're going to have a slightly more optimistic view of what this could mean in the long run, but do you think that this is a sea change moment for Colombia in the way that it seems to be, uh, at least in the Brazilian case? And perhaps Carlos can tell us later whether he thinks it is in the Mexican case. I don't think I am optimistic either. Um, I mean, I think the situation is much better in Colombia, of course, but we already know so the, the data released this week shows 20% of unemployment. Um, so the economic consequences are going to be just really bad. And all the estimates that we see point um, in that direction. The lockdown in Colombia has been extended until July 1st, with the exception of 43 big activities. So it, it will be a, a big number of people going back to work gradually, but Still, it's, I, I read today, I don't know if it's true or not, um, I don't know if the source was that reliable, but that it's the longest lockdown in the world, Colombia, with this extension to July 1st. So I think the economic um, consequences are, are unavoidable, and I think inequality is going to become worse, not just economic inequality, but also geographical inequality, right? if you compare the different regions of the country. The second uh, possibility that I see is an increase of social unrest. So the country was already before, before COVID-19 in a stage where people were mobilizing a lot. And for the first time in, in a long time, not around war and peace and security and policies to, to um, address the armed conflict, but it was really social unrest because of people's frustration with the status quo, with inequality, with protection from the state. And we had a very, very intense movement at the end of last year. Um, with what is happening with the effects on, on the middle class, on the lower class, I think social unrest can actually grow quite a lot. And I don't know what can come out of it, right? Um, as I said before, Colombia is one of the most unequal countries in the world. And I think this could sort of shake people uh, to demand more and, and better redistribution, we'll see. The third key issue that I would emphasize is the implementation of the peace agreement. So I think that, um, with fewer resources and with the population paying less attention, we are going to see an, an even more um, slowed down implementation of the peace agreement with more challenges, with um, fewer parts of the, of the agreement actually being implemented and with less demands from, from the population because people are paying attention to other topics. And this, of course, has all kinds of implications that I can't get into, but I think this is a very worrisome part. And then the last point, politically, um, I'm not sure how, I, how I, I see this coming. As Ben said, I also think this could go in different directions, but maybe one positive thing that may happen is that Colombia has been in a couple of decades of um, a very strong polarization usually around peace and war uh, that has sort of spilled over into many other 
uh, domains as in the US where you suddenly get these two blocks on almost every topic, right? But I think right now the cleavage is maybe changing. I think the virus and the crisis created by the virus may sort of align people along different interests and different views and different priorities. And that may change this um, creation of coalitions and, and sort of what is politically salient uh, in Colombian politics. Um, I also fear that, not just for Colombia, but for the region, that as people are more scared because of poverty and because of the dangers of, for public health, that populism can have uh, a better terrain, that populist candidates and populist governments actually gain a lot of support. I'll leave it at that so that we have time for Q&A. That's wonderful. And um, I think one of the only beneficiaries of this whole crisis is that I've struggled as a historian all my life to try to explain or try to understand and empathize with the position of people in a period like the 1930s, where you don't really know which direction is up, which direction is down. You don't know which way a certain kind of tendency can, can go, what's going to flower into what. And I think um, both your comments and Ben's really emphasize that we're in one of those moments. We know it's going to be a sea change, but it could go in so many different directions, some of them positive, many of them negative. And I think we're all kind of standing on the brink. Um, so we have some, some questions that people have already um, submitted, and I'd like to move on to those just to make sure that we have a chance to get to them. Um, and I'd like to begin, I think, with um, a question that was posed by Jennifer Johnson. And she, she posed this particularly to Carlos and I think to Ana, but it, but it can equally be applicable to Brazil, I think. And that is that there is a particular impact of this pandemic on indigenous peoples. And also I'll extend the question to um, environmental issues. And I wonder if each of you could um, speak a little bit to, er everyone's mentioned in one way or another, the differential impact of this crisis. And I think that, that the question of um, how it affects indigenous peoples and maybe particularly indigenous peoples in areas um, that are subject to incursion by gold miners or prospectors uh, who are subject to violence of all kinds, um, that that's a really, a really crucial uh, impact in, in many areas. So I'll turn maybe first to, to Carlos for that, the impact on indigenous peoples in Mexico, and then to Ana and then to Ben. Yes. Uh, well, the thing is, uh, in, well, of course we know there's a very close correlation in Mexico between extreme poverty and indigenous populations about i think that the the last number was on the high 70s uh, like 78 percent of indigenous peoples in mexico live uh in poverty in many cases extreme poverty uh so of course you no know, be only because of that certainly you know they live in places where health services are very scant very low quality where state presence many times is, you know, uh, almost non-existent. Um, you know, President López Obrador launched this program called Municipios de la Esperanza, Municipalities of Hope, uh, according to a map in which there were certain areas of the country where there were no, no uh, positive cases, not even, you know, official deaths. And, uh, well, he said, you know, these are going to be the municipalities that are going to open back sooner because you know they seem to be safe an analysis by alberto diaz calleros professor in stanford showed very convincingly that the reason why these areas of the country did not register any contagions or any deaths was because they're, they're, they were not under the vigilance system that they, that of the sentinella uh the sentinella system that mexico has been relying on uh so you know it, this was really not, you know, hope, but ignorance that was driving uh, this program. Deliberate ignorance in many ways because of the decision not to carry out massive testing. Uh, also, an, another way in which, you know, indigenous communities are, are, are going to be hit is not only because of this, but also because the government has pushed certain changes in terms of energy policy, particularly regarding alternative energies which we know, for instance, in the case of Oaxaca or in the case of Yucatan, there are, you know, there's, you know, important foreign investment in terms of wind, solar, uh, hydroelectrics, thermo, thermoelectric uh, energy. And this, these changes have deliberately pushed 
for the prices of, al of alternative sources of energy of renewables to go higher in order for Mexico to be able to you know, consume certain uh, residues of the refining process and sell, sell them as you know, alternative fuels, which are very, very contaminant. But at the same time, Mexico has nothing to do with these things because nobody buys them anymore, precisely because they are so you know, damaging to, to people's health. So uh, in many ways, these, it's funny, it, it's ironic, because on the one hand, it is not as if indigenous communities, you know, and in the territories in which, you know, these sources of alternative or renewables have been installed are against renewable energies as such, but they have been against the way in which these, uh, you know, companies have installed all these, for instance, uh, ventilators, wing ventilators, but the benefits of that have not, you know, trickled down to the communities. Uh, some of those communities don't even have electricity, for instance, even though so much energy is being produced literally right around the corner. Uh, so this has shaken things up, but I don't think in, in a positive way. Uh, you know, what we would have liked to see is, you know, for the government to intervene more, more forcefully and, you know, reach some sort of agreement between, you know, these, these, the communities in these territories and the alternative energies companies in order for the communities to, to get more benefits from this, uh, but not just to, to shut down these, these companies or shut down investment in alternative energies. Uh, of course, something that we haven't mentioned, uh, but in the case, I think in particular in the case of Brazil and Mexico is very important, is a parallel crisis, which was the oil crisis and the, and the prices of oil going, you know, tanking and for Mexico, this, of course, has been a source also of lost revenue, of lost fiscal maneuvering capacity. And, uh, you know, in many ways, this will, this will also impact, uh, you know, certain communities that live around Pemex projects, not only refineries, but more general people who, you know, there are certain communities where a lot of the people work at Pemex, the, the national oil industry, that will be, of course, affected because of this. So. Um, in general, just, just to finish, I think that uh, indigenous communities have, we, don't, we really don't know how hard have, have they been hit because our capacity to produce, to produce reliable information on what is going on in the ground in those communities is very, very scant. Sure. But I'm not optimistic at all. That seems to be the theme. Uh, Anna, well, uh, you mentioned this in your earlier comments uh, where you brought up the, the differential impact um, by ethnicity and race and region. And I wonder what the indigenous question in particular looks like in Colombia. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, these communities are really vulnerable and are at great risk right now. A lot of them don't have access to drinkable water, to sanitation. The closest health center is really far away. Sometimes it's really costly to get there. So they are at a very high risk. Um, most of these communities have actually followed the lockdown quite strictly, but they rely on subsistence economies. And so without help, they are just going hungry. Uh, the state really needs to, to devise very specific means to implement in these territories and to help these communities. I think um, that going to, to the issue of the environment, I think one, actually one point that I wanted to mention before and I didn't try to be brief, um, is that one of the potential effects of this crisis is that illicit economies and, and organized criminal groups actually grow and expand because as more people lose any capacity to actually make a living in the legal sector, you can see more participation in these economies. And one of the effects of this is, for example, with illegal mining, that you see not just worse situations in terms of, of human rights, because of course these groups violate a lot of human rights, but also that you have more negative effects on the environment, right? So the more the legal options are, are closed because of the destruction of a lot of jobs, because of the destruction of a lot of firms and just economic activities, um, and the more you see people going to this informal sector, the less protections for the environment you are going to see. So here we could also see a very negative effect of, of the crisis. And I'll, I'll leave time to Ben Great. to respond as well. Ben, please. I mean, I'm happy to, you know, answer a different question. I don't think, I don't, I'm not an expert on the indigenous situation here beyond what I've read in the, in the newspapers. I think one thing that's worth mentioning though, is the, um, the context of 
uh, the Bolsonaro government's uh, sort of, you know, uh, long-standing project to open up the Amazon to increased exploitation, uh, to 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 um, sort of rescind uh, indigenous uh, land demarcation, to open up some indigenous land for exploitation, and it's just general lack of concern, if not outright disdain for indigenous communities, is obviously exacerbated uh, with the crisis. And, um, you know, this was just, a, if it didn't, you know, for those of you who don't follow the news that closely, a, a, a very serious indicator of this was uh, during a recent, there was a ministerial uh, meeting that got in it, that was, it, the, the video of which was forced uh, into the public by the Supreme Court. And it was mostly concerning sort of, uh, in, you know, uh, federal police investigation uh, concerning Bolsonaro himself, but there was a whole lot of fallout from it. And one of the pieces of fallout that was really telling was that the Minister of the Environment, uh, Ricardo Salas, who is you know, a known proponent of opening up the Amazon, has been openly advocating for this since, since the beginning of the Bolsonaro government, is on tape saying, let's take advantage. The press is totally distracted with COVID, all the stories are about COVID. Let's take advantage to get our measures through and relax you know, the restrictions. He's, and he said, you know, normally every time we do anything, uh, the press attacks us and it gets taken up with the courts. He's like, right now, both the courts and the press are distracted. This is a great time to do environmental deregulation. Now that in and of itself caused a little mini crisis. So the good news is there was a lot of pushback uh, from civil society. Even some of the corporations who have aligned themselves with Salas had to kind of cut their ties Nonetheless, I think it indicates that, you know, from a governance perspective, uh, the, 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 the crisis has been, you know, just yet another disaster uh, and interacted with that sort of government disaster for, for indigenous folks. Thank you, Ben. And, and I would add to that that um, I think that it's not by chance that the first death that was registered in, um, of an indigenous person in Brazil was from a community where the means of transmission was through illegal gold mining. And so that, that connection that Ana made in Colombia, I think is very relevant um, in Brazil. And also that Manaus has actually been one of the cities that per capita, the city that per capita has, has had the worst um, profile in Brazil. And oftentimes we think of this as a crisis that is being um, really felt the worst in the most industrialized um, cities of, of various countries. And I think what Carlos said about lack of measurement, about invisibilization, about marginalization is a huge part of the story everywhere. And, and after the crisis is over, I think that's something that we're gonna learn more about. Um, so we have five minutes until the end of this webinar and we have lots of good questions. Um, quite a few of them actually about the, the results of all of this on presidential politics. And I think especially in, uh, uh, excuse me, in, in Mexico and in Brazil, um, because we have presidents that, that are attempting to, to uh, before this crisis, enact such sweeping change, I think the question is particularly salient in those um, regards. But we also have questions about um, whether or not there's scientific movement in, in any of these countries to really do work on treatments and vaccines. Um, we have questions about what are the, what's the applicability of measures that have been taken in Asia and Europe to Latin America. And rather than, since we don't have time, um, choosing which of those questions, I'm just going to turn uh, the, the microphone, the figurative microphone, to each of our panelists to conclude. And if you would like to make a comment on one of the questions in the cha chat box, that would be great. Um, but uh, if there's anything else that's really, that you feel is very urgently, I'll just ask each of the panelists to take no more than two minutes since we are reaching the end of time. Thank you. Um, maybe we can begin um, with Anna. Sure. Well, thank you so much and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I guess I'll, I'll answer very briefly the question about how COVID-19 intersects with the armed conflict. And I would say that for the implementation of the peace agreement, which is a very complex and, and demanding agreement, you need resources and you need mobilization from civil society. You need a lot of pressure from from the population and from citizens because the agenda of the government in office was actually to go against the, the peace agreement. So anything that is done is done because there is a lot of pressure for it. So COVID-19 reduces resources substantially because a lot of, of the resources are going to be used in dealing with the crisis and because the economy is going to be just really shrunk, right? We are going to have, um, very low economic growth or a disacceleration, right? So 
That's one thing. And the other thing is we may find that civil society just doesn't have the capacity to be on top of everything right now. And I fear that the implementation of the peace agreements, protecting the lives of social leaders, protecting the lives of ex-combatants and trying to help with um, their reincorporation process, that is not going to be a priority of many citizens. Some civil society organizations are going to continue uh, battling and pushing for this, but the country as a whole, I think, is going to put the peace agreement implementation sort of like in a corner. And I fear this is going to facilitate the abandonment of a lot of parts of the, of the agreement, which in turn can have all kinds of implications for, for the country uh, and that can have actually long lasting consequences. Thank you, Anna. That was wonderfully concise, if um, quite depressing. Um, so why don't we go on now to Carlos? Uh, and again, if everybody can stick to about two minutes, that would be great. Yes, sure. Uh, in terms of the impact on presidential politics, we've seen in Mexico, uh, you know, a, a, a small increase in the president's, you know, poll approval, which pol political scientists all across the board, the political spectrum, have explained as what they call a rally around the flag effect, particularly because of the health menace. But, you know, pollsters are estimating that once the rallying around the flag effect, you know, wears off with time, there, there might be a significant drop in the president's approval, particularly once the economic impact of the, of the health crisis and also of the uh, official response, of the, of the policy response, uh, hit the population. Uh, this might end up leading to a sort of political void. If the president, president's approval falls below 50, 40 percent, you know, th there are no alternative leaderships yet in the opposition to become salient. So uh, I, I think a political void is, ve is very likely to, to develop as a consequence. Uh, in terms of the sea change, I think COVID is becoming a sea change within a sea change that was already happening in Mexico. Uh, I think the the vision that the president had for his term and his transformation is, it was already difficult, but now it's really non-viable. Uh, and what we're going to see in the years to come is the president struggling with, you know, reckoning with the fact that what, what he wanted to do is no longer viable under these conditions. Uh, and finally, just to finish, there is indeed a scientific movement in Mexico, not necessarily in terms of developing treatments or, machine, or vaccines, but moreover, in terms of criticizing the lack of transparency of the epidemiological model that the government is following and protesting against, you know, very significant cuts in the budget for the academic, for the scientific community, you know, as part of the larger cuts that are being put in place all across the board. We've seen the government trying to exploit the authority of science or the authority of experts to leg legitimize its response in terms of the health crisis. But at the same time, the government has been very dismissive of experts or social scientists in terms of its economic response. So I think we will, we're also going to see a radicalization, so to speak, of, of the scientific community as, you know, against the, the government uh, and the measures it's taking. All right, Ben, close us out. Great. Uh, thanks, everybody, again, for a great panel. I think I'll just take my last two minutes to say that, uh, you know, many, so the things that, you know, things that I study and, uh, and care greatly about in Brazil and things that many of us uh, study and, and are, uh, care about in Brazil are continuing on uh, in the midst of the crisis, uh, the COVID crisis, in some ways being exacerbated and in some ways, uh, uh, and, and, and in some ways being brought to the fore uh, and in other ways being hi hidden or, or papered over by the crisis. So I'll just tell you a couple of examples. Uh, as as, as sh this is absolutely shocking to me. So the police uh, in, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, where you might think they would be sort of, you know, occupied with enforcing the shutdown or doing, you know, other sorts of uh, public health related activities, have nonetheless found time to not only continue uh, their very violent policing of Rio's favelas, but to actually increase the rate at which they've been uh, killing civilians in armed confrontation. So in the month of April, at the sort of height of this crisis, police in Rio killed 177 civilians, uh, which is, a, I think, a 50%, 43% increase over 
last year, 2019, which was a record year. And the governor of Rio, Wilson Witzel, was elected on a platform that he would let the police do their job and kill more criminals. So 2018 was a record. Wilson gets elected, Witzel gets elected, and he increases that number in 2019. And now even amidst the COVID crisis, even amidst this tug of war with President Bolsonaro, because Witzel has become an enemy of Bolsonaro and is threatening to run against him uh, in the next election, he's, the, 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 the sort of policy, hardline policy of lethal policing continues. At the same time, issues of criminal governance were brought to the fore by this, by this crisis. So much of Rio's uh, informal urban periphery is governed by different criminal groups, both drug trafficking organizations like the Comando Vermelho and police-linked milicias. And they have played their role in COVID response, both in a positive way, in some cases, as uh, much as Carlos suggested, doing handouts, enforcing lockdowns, fighting price, price gouging by local markets, really playing the role that the state should be playing. But in other cases, forcing businesses to stay open so that they could pay uh, their protection fees. This is also happening some, in some places in Medellin, I, I happen to know. So you can see that criminal governance playing both, uh, you know, this very complex role that it played before the crisis, but now really heightened uh, by, the, by the situation where on, on the one hand, helping to keep order, helping to keep society functioning, and working in some ways hand in hand with the state and at the same time with the potential to vastly undermine state policies and at, you know, at the expense of course of the worst off members of society. So you know, uh, that part of Brazil hasn't stopped. In some ways it's gotten worse. And in many ways the COVID crisis has brought it to the fore in a kind of undeniable way. I'll stop there. All right, well, if one of the dangers from this crisis is the marginalization of information and the proliferation of disinformation and the invisibilization of many sectors in the population, uh, I think our panelists have really done a nice job of trying to work against those uh, currents. And I'm really grateful to Ben and Ana and Carlos for your time. Um, this has been incredibly rich. It's given us all so much to think about. Um, so I give you a virtual uh, round of applause. To all of you too. And thanks Thank to you. everyone who was uh, who stuck around until the end and uh, took the time to join us today. Bye bye.